from 11FS, this is Fintech Insider News, and I'm your host, Ross Gallagher, Ventures Director at 11FS. Thanks for downloading this podcast. If you like what you hear, why not recommend it to a friend? This week, we're talking Galileo Buy Now, Pay Later, and MasterCard team up to support SMBs. Find out what the panel think about BMPL in an SMB context. And Goldman Sachs look to sell off their consumer lending business after announcing a 33% drop in their net profits last quarter. We've got the inside scoop on that one. And a judge rules Citibank are right to sack an employee after expensing a sandwich for someone else. Sign of the times. We get into all this and much more in today's show. We'll be back after these messages. Hey folks, we have super duper exciting news. The shortlist for this year's 11FS Awards is officially live. We asked you, the incredible FinTech Insider community, to help us choose the deserving winners of the 11FS Awards, and your response was outstanding. You voted in record numbers, and it's now time to see if your favorite fintech companies made the shortlist. With a total of 10 different awards up for grabs on the big night, including categories like Best Experience Design, Fintech for Good, Best Use of AI, and Consumer Game Changer, there is a lot to look forward to. Don't wait. Explore that full shortlist now at 11fsawards.com. That is 11fsawards.com. Dot com. And be sure to stay tuned to all of our channels to find out who will take home one of the coveted 11FS award trophies on Wednesday, 15th of November. Hello and welcome, LFG people, to Fintech Insider, Blockchain Insider, 11FS Spotlight, 11FS Explores, Open Mic Night, After Dark. <laughs> Through our podcasts, videos, newsletters, and live events, we have a direct line to a truly global fintech community. So if you're looking to sponsor and collaborate on content that connects with everybody from fintech beginners to the biggest VCs, then chat to our team at sponsors at 11fs.com or visit 11fs.com to find out more. Long live the community. Hello and welcome to episode 795 of Fintech Insider. I'm Ross Gallagher, Ventures Director here at 11FS, and I am joined this week on Fintech Insider News by my co-host, Rachel Pandian, Ventures Product Lead here at 11FS. Rach, wonderful to have you on the show. How are you doing? I am a little bit overwhelmed by the scale of our production unit, but um, no, really excited to be here, especially in our new office. Excellent. Yeah, you are repping in the studio on your own, which does make it look like you are a tiny ant in a massive room, <laughs> but that's okay. Someone has to do it. Um, but great to have you, Rach, um, and thanks for jumping on. And with Rach and I today, we have some great guests who are here to break down this week's biggest stories in fintech and financial services. So firstly, it's a big fintech insider hello to Calypso Highland, the founder of Fintech Fringe. So Calypso, it's really great to have you here. Maybe you can just uh, introduce yourselves to our listeners and and, and a little bit about uh, Fintech Fringe as well. Sure. Uh, Thank you, Ross. Uh, Thanks for having me on the show. And uh, yes, what we're doing at Fintech Fringe is is really centered around the scale and growth of fintechs. So providing the essential support and advice that fintechs need um, on their growth journey. So uh, we do that in a a couple of different ways. Um, We um, launch with our our first event during London Tech Week, bit of an ambitious um, production, I have to admit. It was a a bit of a brain fart in um, in March. We're like, where's all the fintech content at London Tech Week? And, um, and, And and there wasn't really much, so decided to do something about it. And um, anyway, it was a, a huge success. Um, and uh, I, I worked together um, with a, a wonderful woman called Olivia Minnick, who previously used to be the editor at FinTech Alliance, and, and now she's at MMOB. And um, and yeah, and anyway, it went down really well because I think um, a lot of uh, FinTech conferences sort of focus on technology and solutions, right? But there's very little that focuses on how can we support leaders? And um, it's not just about supporting company growth, but how do we support leaders on their personal growth, right? How do we make them more successful? Because in turn, if they're successful, their companies are as well. So, um, so yeah, so it was a, a neat little proposition. Um, now we've um, 
turn that into a platform, uh, connecting uh, fintechs with experts and essential support across the ecosystem. So we're hoping that that's going to bring together all the disparate parts of the fintech ecosystem and and um, and help people access the the vital support that they need. So not only for for UK companies, but also for those um, fintechs from overseas markets who are looking to set up here in the UK. That's amazing. I mean, um, congratulations. Sometimes I suppose that the craziest ideas are the best, right? Um, but um, no, I mean, such an enabler, as you say, for that fintech ecosystem. So um, yeah, I mean, that's that's really, really cool. And thank you for jumping on as well and um, sort of sharing your insights. And then a big welcome back, I guess, a, a dab hand at Fintech Insider now, uh, Jason McCullough, Fintech Advisor, formerly at Goldman Sachs. Jason, as ever, um, thank you for joining us. Um, Maybe again, you can just sort of, I guess, reintroduce yourself um, and a little bit about what you do. Yeah, of course. So for listeners who who aren't familiar, you know, I spent over a decade in the consumer credit space, primarily in the U.S., including uh, building the lending business Goldman is now dismantling Marcus. Uh, I as well as to first on that story. Yes, <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll I'll hold my tongue until we get to that section. <laughs> uh, and now I kind of split my time between uh, writing, publishing, and podcasting. Uh, so listeners can find that at fintechbusinessweekly.com. And I also uh, advise and consult in the early to mid stage uh, fintech startup space. Amazing. We well, should get you on our on our platform, Jason. I'm sure you'd be um, plucked up in a second. Yes, we should. <laughs> Always be closing. Um, excellent. All right. Well, look, uh, that's our panel. So let's just dive straight in. Let's get into the news. Um, we've teased this one already. Our first story comes from readwrite.com uh, with the headline, Goldman Sachs could pull out of consumer lending after reporting a 33% profit drop. So just a few days ago, the investment bank announced a 33% drop in net profits for the past quarter. Uh, Reuters reported this was better than forecast as a nascent recovery in deal making offset an $864 write down of their Green Sky sale. The fintech Green Sky was Goldman's lending platform, which they recently confirmed they were selling, thus putting an end to their consumer lending business. Full exit from this space would put an end to their relationship with Apple. They currently offer several Apple products, including credit cards, though it was reported last year that their loss rate was the highest among big US card issuers. So Jason, I did say that I was going to come to you first on this one. Um, As you say, you helped, um, I suppose, build this lending business. Uh, What's your read on um, it now being disassembled? Yeah, I mean, the the most recent bit of news here, which is um, finalizing the sale of Green Sky, is not surprising, right? We we knew that that was being negotiated and, and was in the works for quite some time. You know, obviously the you know the write down. So I, they paid, I think, one point seven billion to acquire Green Sky, pretty much at the height of the market. So it's like a bit over a year ago, year and a half ago. Uh, and now sold it. I want to say it was like around 500, 600 million. So, I mean, that, you know, the optics of that aren't, aren't great as far as, um, you know, Goldman's image or brand as a, a savvy, you know, deal maker. Um, you know, that said, uh, given the scope of Goldman, Goldman's business, Goldman's balance sheet, it, it really is a rounding error. Um, I mean, I think the, the pieces going forward to watch, as you noted, are, what happens with that Apple relationship, right? So Goldman has made it you know, pretty clear, and there was some reporting in the Wall Street Journal a bit earlier this year, that Goldman was in talks with American Express to you know, potentially take over that Apple relationship. I mean, there's a couple of um, wrenches uh, in, in moving that forward. One, which you pointed out, is the high loss rate. So last quarter, Charge-offs were 5.8% in that Apple Card portfolio, which is is really high, right? I mean, typically you might expect more like a two to three percent charge-off rate. So uh, losses are quite high. Those did come down slightly in the current quarter to 5.1%, but still, you know, uncomfortably high, particularly for a lender like Amex, which tends to focus on prime, super prime segment. The second piece is. Uh, the savings feature that Goldman powers for Apple. Uh, I had read that they actually sort of wanted to cap, Goldman wanted to cap how many deposits it took in through that capability, because if they need to move the card partnership, those deposits most likely go with it. 
And if you're a Goldman and you've deployed those deposits and all of a sudden you need to shift them off your balance sheet, they need to plug that hole with uh, presumably a substantially more expensive source of funding. So a lot of moving pieces, like I said, green sky piece, embarrassing, not surprising. Um, and yeah, it looks like you know this is the the full retreat from from the consumer segment that Goldman spent you know billions of dollars and I forget six seven years trying to build a business in. It's spectacular, really, isn't it? In terms of that um, that strategic, I suppose, turnaround. But I mean, look. Rachel, you you probably see this every day. Like retail banking is competitive, and it's not an easy space necessarily to to make a success in. Yeah, it's so true, and I think particularly with a brand like Apple, the expectations and the hype that comes with that doesn't necessarily come with the financial due diligence on a customer side. Like I can just imagine, like you see the hype for the iPhones, and all of a sudden they launch a credit card, and it's branded Apple, and you you go head over heel to to get that product. I don't know if it necessarily converts into the high quality customer that you're looking for versus, you know, Amex have built a brand around this is the experience, this is the kind of credit card you're looking for. And so I don't know, I I have a, I'm really curious about where Apple take this because you know, moving away from Goldman, now they've got open banking in the UK and you can integrate your accounts in, you're starting to see your balances. Do they still pursue these partnership relationships? Because, you know, these partners do come with all of the financial expertise and and the infrastructure to deliver these products. But actually, is it better for Apple to focus in on their own internal strategy, as we've seen like a lot of the, the big providers do and launch things by themselves? So, yeah, cur- I'm curious to see where Goldman go. More curious to see where Apple go off the back of something like this. Yeah, interesting. I think I think it's um, the, the the point you make about the, the 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 open banking functionality that they've rolled out recently, and now you can see balance, balances directly in the the Apple Wallet. I think for me that shows a level of commitment from Apple in this space. Jason, back to your point about how um, Goldman are actively hedging in terms of those deposits around potentially getting out of this space again in the future, um, I think is also telling. Um, Calypso, what was your sort of initial reaction um, when you uh, when you read this story? Well, I think it was, um, you know, what you were, um, uh, you know, saying earlier around um, what kind of customer base they're building, I think is is, is really particularly interesting. And, um, and when you're kind of looking at, you know, this kind of buy now, pay later, you know, kind of um, available credit, you know, on all extending that out to all of your Apple, you know, products and deferring payments on that and continuing that 0% interest, you know, kind of credit arrangement, is it kind of building the customer base that you want? And how attractive is that going to look to, you know, a new lender? You know, um, you know, we've seen Amex kind of build up um, and invest significantly in attracting a certain kind of um uh, customer, you know, is that going to suit the profile of, you know, the Apple customer base? You know, that's really curious. Um, and, you know, to your point, Jason, um, yes, I think, uh, you know, going and getting um, financing for Goldman Sachs to go and cover all of, um, you know, the, the transfer of those, you know, um, savings is going to leave a big hole. And, you um, and they're also probably going to have to pay, you know, a, a huge amount of money in breakup fees and penalties because I believe they just signed a new partnership deal um, in 2019 to extend until 2029. Was that correct? Yeah. So, so what, what what's the the financial burden going to be to Goldman Sachs? I mean, that's that's going to be potentially huge. So, um, you yeah, know, be interesting to see how how they get out of that. But I guess that's all being kind of calculated in their you know move against. Um, you know, uh, getting into consumer lending after that investment, um, I'm, I'm sure a tremendous amount of thought has gone into that. <laughs> so. It's also an interesting point about like Apple and buy now, pay later that they've launched because Apple have been on in-store products for however long as a business. Like they've been connected with Barclays Partner Finance for however long. Consumers have had this relationship with Apple, whether they're doing it um, like I think they have interest free or they have like interest installments to buy these products. And you kind of think about, uh, I was talking to someone earlier today about the Starbucks ecosystem and how they've created their own little bank that no one really knows about, but they have so much money because people are just topping up these cards. Like, what does that actually look like for Apple? Because they have been playing in that space for a really long time. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's what I'll be interested to watch on the Apple side is, you know, if you uh, follow the reporting as closely, unfortunately, as I do, um, you know, you see some of these pieces where it was like some of the challenges in the Apple Goldman relationship seem to have been driven by very specific things that Apple wanted. So, for instance, <clears throat> uh, all of the bills, the billing cycle for every customer is identical on the calendar month. And that drives a huge uptick in customer service calls when those bills go out. A typical card issuer would have billing cycles that are distributed across the month. This is something Apple wanted that Goldman pushed back on and lost. I mean, even things as silly seeming as like the font selection in certain disclosures. Financial services companies hate to deviate from the regulatory safe harbor by messing around with things as as minuscule as what is the font, what is the font size. Apple wanted a different font. So it'll be interesting if Apple moves to take on more of running these programs, whether it's the BNPL or whether it's the credit card or savings on its own plate, how it deals with managing some of these admittedly boring but also very important complexities of running a financial services program. And it's it's that classic thing, like that Apple is famous for, like wanting to own and be in control of all of these things. And and Jason, I remember like when this partnership was announced initially, it was a it felt like a real get for Goldman in terms of the Apple card and this really sexy product with this really sexy brand. Is this like is the reality now starting to hit home? And how much is that then gonna feed into decisions at the likes of Amex and, and and other providers in terms of potentially taking this partnership on moving forward. Yeah, I mean, the, the optics, I think you're entirely right, that it it was perceived and presented in, in the press and media as a big win for Goldman, you know, Goldman taking a big step into whatever, fintech, banking as a service. Although, frankly, it's basically a co-brand card, which, as we know, players like Barclays, uh, as well as, you know, your big money center banks, JP Morgan Chase, uh, Bank of America have been doing for a long time. I mean, the reality is more complicated, and it's basically the other banks that were bidding for this business didn't accept the terms that Apple was offering, which in retrospect looks like a very smart decision given the performance of, of the program and the fact that, that Goldman now wants out of it. Um, I think it'll be interesting to see you know, if anyone is willing to take this business from Goldman, and if so, on what terms. Um, you know, again, going to how Apple was sort of controlling aspects of this relationship and, and linking back to the high charge-offs we talked about earlier, you know, if you're Apple and you're a mass consumer brand, if, I, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, like more than 50% market share in the US, and you're offering a credit card, you want an experience where your Apple iPhone customers are approved. They push to have a, a, a wider credit box, a, a looser approval policy than Goldman's existing products. If you looked, you know, going back in time a year, 18 months or so, Goldman's Marcus personal loan portfolio was almost exclusively prime above 680 FICO. The Apple card portfolio, I want to say it was like 25% or more subprime below 680. That was not a decision that Goldman made. That was a decision that Apple made that Goldman had to agree to, right? So it's going to be very interesting to see, you know, as Goldman tries to get out of this relationship, who's willing to take it and on what terms. Yeah, I completely agree. And actually, that's such an interesting um, insight around the FICO score. And of course, the difference in terms of the brand impact for a brand like Apple in um, rejecting people for credit versus banks. Um, And so I think that's a really interesting consideration. Um, Rachel, final word to you on this one. If I bring it back to uh, Green Sky, because that is uh, the lead on this, despite the fact that we've we've talked about Apple for the most part, they're being acquired by a um, consortium of investors. Do you think those uh, investors can be bullish and optimistic on their acquisition in the future of uh, the future of Green Sky? I, yeah, I think I think the reason why Green Sky didn't work out for Goldman isn't necessarily because of Green Sky itself. I think Goldman, when you think about the other, you know, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, the way they've diversified their portfolios versus Goldman, I think it is significantly different. And I think that in the right environment with the right partner, 
they would probably do well. It's, it, you know, it's about the market. It's about the rest of the business and like how how set up you are to be able to house a business like this. Like to Jason's point, they bought at the peak of the market. Should you have invested in a company like Green Sky sooner? Probably because if you're buying at the peak of the market, are you perhaps late to the game? So my view is that Goldman entered re- like retail lending at a really interesting time. I don't know if they were fully set up for that kind of model in the same way that um, some of the other retail offerings from investment banks have um, have landed. Really briefly, I think that's exactly right. The Green Sky business wasn't a bad business. Actually, it improved while gold in the brief time that Goldman owned it. The challenge was Goldman wanted to pivot away from anything consumer. And so even though the business itself was, you know, okay, it no longer made sense in Goldman's wider strategy. And and thus the embarrassing decision to jettison it at a substantial loss, you know, a year or so after acquiring it. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Um, I look, I completely agree. I think it's going to go on to be a successful business. Um, and it, it just wasn't right for Goldman. Um, and I guess timing is everything, right? Um, all right, then. I'm going to move us on to our next story. This one comes from the FinTech Times. Uh, so Galileo expands buy now, pay later offering to SMBs with MasterCard installments. So research from MasterCard reveals over 80% of small businesses are looking for faster and easier access to capital. Galileo's BMPL service hopes the new partnership will provide more flexibility to SMBs. By partnering with MasterCard installments, Galileo's BMPL customers can now access a digital virtual card for critical purchases and better manage their payment schedules. It's the latest in a string of partnerships between the two companies. Earlier this month, Galileo also became the first company to receive multi-market MasterCard certification across LATAM. This new partnership with MasterCard installments comes as ClearPay releases a new BNPL report. The UK-based research claims that nearly 80% of BNPL customers find BNPL helpful in reducing financial stress. Now, if I just rephrase that, BNPL provider releases research that says that most people like BNPL. Now, not to be too cynical, (laughs) but Rachel, maybe if I come to you first on this, uh, am I being too cynical or is that a fair take? I really struggle with buy now, pay later for lots and lots of reasons. SMEs are maybe the only use case I will not kick up a stink about them. And so buy now, pay later in general is a very sneaky way of introducing loans into retail banking. From a retail perspective, that's awful because you are thinking about people who aren't in the best of positions who are buying things like iPhones and expensive products, trying to keep up with the, you know, keep up with the Joneses and they end up in worse positions. From an SME perspective, I feel differently. And why I feel differently is because when we think about SMBs, SMEs, if we think about actual small businesses, the biggest issue that smaller micro businesses have is that they can't prove creditworthiness. And so they are constantly struggling with cash flow. They are losing relationships with suppliers. We saw this, we had a project in Jordan. Most of the the small businesses were like, listen, my supplier isn't bringing the goods. My business is going to go under. You think I'll be credit worthy then? And so by introducing something like this for small businesses, specifically this, I think it I think it is a great move because we're so, you know, you need so much to prove that you are a worthy business. But hey, you know, in villages in India, there are so many shops that have just been existing for years, for decades. And they exist because cash Cash is what runs them, not mobile and digital banking. And there are still areas of the world where lending is possible. So I think it is great to bring these digital services that provide actual value for business because, you know, you can offer all the fancy onboarding that you want. But, you know, small businesses, they need capital to to survive. And I think that's why it's it's really important. Yeah, I agree. I think that SME, SMB lens, um, as you put on it, is so important. And Calypso, I mean, I'm sure um, you see this as well in terms of the people that you speak to in that sort of fintech ecosystem. It still feels like there's a way to go in terms of really servicing the needs of SMEs. And I think particularly in terms of access to financing. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think um, you know, kind of short term financing is 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 absolutely essential and critical kind of during this time. You know, we've seen a, a real flattening out of of customer acquisition, um, you know, across the majority of kind of fintechs. You know, from the you know the the height of activity kind of during COVID times, um, and you know, it's only natural that kind of things, you know, have have taken a dip. You know, as everyone's kind of um, adopting more kind of resilient you know kind of business practice. So I think um, you know being able to have access to you know to short-term lending buy now pay later is is essential you know for the fintechs that we're seeing in fact we are running an event on um alternative funding options for fintechs on november 9th so um it's it's, it's quite apt and it's also highlighted that we don't have anyone in the bnpl um space kind of presenting so actually <laughs> thanks for reminding me of that <laughs> i love that i love that i think um one of the issues or maybe the issue with um, I think servicing the needs of these SMEs, SMBs, is because they're so unique and they're so diverse, and they don't. There isn't, you know, no one SME, SMB is is the same as the next. And so I suppose the problems that they have, there's as many problems as there are actual SMEs, um, essentially. And I think big banks in particular struggle to make the economics work. How much, I suppose, um, Jason, do you think these types of partnerships, Galileo building on top of Mastercard installments? is is going to help address that. Yeah, I mean it certainly helps achieve distribution, right? And I mean I think to to some of the prior comments, you know, in, in the B2B space or or buy now pay later for for small businesses, um you know, I also find it less potentially troubling than in the consumer space in the sense that you already have a lot of different kinds of financing that exist in this relationship between small businesses and and their vendors. I mean, we might not think of it as financing, but if I, you know, issue 11 FS an invoice and the terms are net 30, net 60, net 90, that is essentially a form of credit. I've provided a service and you're paying for it later. Um, on the flip side, you know, invoice factoring. So if if I've you know I've issued those invoices, but I need that capital now because I need to turn around and use you know deploy it to do something. I can take that invoice and essentially sell it at a discount to get cash up front, right? So I think the the, the concept of buy now pay later in this business to business space, you know, has. Uh, well-proven existing analogs. And one of the things that that you could argue is actually good is that it takes that credit risk off either the business issuing the invoice uh, or the business making the payment, right? So like it's an intermediary that's providing that service and taking credit risk as opposed to like, oh man, you know, if I issue 11 FS an invoice and you know you guys just ghost me or go bankrupt i'm never going to see that money whereas if you have that intermediary like i still got paid and you know now it's somebody else's problem um and i i do think the sort of galileo mastercard installments etc you know help drive distribution which you know in in the lending space and even if you want to call it bnpl you know fundamentally it's still lending um you know, distribution and cap cost of acquiring those customers uh, is always a key component into whether or not the business model and the economics are workable. I think your point about distribution is so true because we all like to talk about buy now, pay later and, you know, Monzo Flex. It's it's the new thing, but these kind of services have existed for such a long time. We Again, we had a project and we were working with a Turkish digital bank and they They've talked about flex for years. Like that's how they do loans. It's in, you know, small installments, interest free, pay back later. Like it's it's so standard. But now we're just we're putting a new name to it, kind of in the same way like that all these buzzwords come through the industry. And so I think, yes, it it is a good thing, Ross, but it's more about the distribution, like more ways to get access to this funding as opposed to the traditional methods. That's the that's the exciting thing as opposed to like buy now, pay later being this big industry shaking event it's just uh, more people are doing it now that's great i really like that point and especially when you zoom out you just think about it in terms of distribution and financing and you start to think about all right well actually there's some non-traditional what we would consider non-traditional players that are moving into this space right there's um there are um supply chain like suppliers that are offering supply chain financing there are the pos providers um 
that have access to all of the data that goes through your business and can make better credit decisioning and risk decisions um, more quickly and sort of get a better a, a better look on on affordability. So I agree. I, I, I and and Calypso, I guess a, a a real outcome of being able to offer that funding in a more timely fashion um, is you're you're actually empowering businesses with the funds, the tools that they need to actually grow and be successful, right? And we all benefit from that. Yes, absolutely. I concur. Yeah. Um, so no, look, I mean, I think um, definitely what we're saying, I, like I, I, I opened this up and I said, it feels like there's still a way to go until we are really um, sort of hitting the mark on um, sort of addressing the needs and particularly the financing needs of um, small businesses in particular. Um, but I think there are different types of innovative propositions and different types of non-traditional players um, that are really starting to to pick up the bat on here. Um, and I think being able to offer sort of tailored credit at the point of need um, in the same way that, that something like this is, I think is an absolute game changer. So definitely one that we will continue to keep an eye on. Um, and yeah, one that we'll be interested to see uh, where this goes. All right. Um, so we're just going to take a really quick pause here, but we'll be back with you very shortly. Commercial banking is changing faster than many banks can keep pace with. The innovation that's been unleashed by digital technologies and fintechs has transformed what commercial banking looks like today. In our brand new report, in association with Infosys Finical, we explore the new generation of commercial banking, how value chains are being transformed, and what banks need to do to thrive in this new ecosystem. A must-read report for anyone in commercial banking, we combine our insights with those of 14 thought leaders from across financial services to break down the current situation, the catalysts of change, and what impact it will have on the industry. Don't miss out. Download your copy today at 11fs.com forward slash commercial banking. Welcome back. Before we get back into the second half of the news, a note to go check out our most recent FinTech Insider Insight Show. I was joined by some great guests to discuss how we can manage the wealth of the future. We take a closer look at who Gens Alpha and Beta are, what they expect from financial services, and what is being done now to prepare them for success in the future. We also discuss what banking could look like in the future and how FinTechs can step up to serve the wealth makers of tomorrow. So go check out that episode in your podcast feed. It's the one just below this one. Now let's get back to the news. Now this one comes from AltFi with a headline, Zilch launches Zilch up to help, quote, credit invisible customers. So Zilch is an ad subsidized payment network in the UK called the Googleization of Payments by its CEO, Philip Bellinant. And it now hopes to increase access of its services to millions of, quote, credit invisible customers. Zilch Up combines zero interest borrowing with the ability to improve credit score. On the new Zilch Up platform, credit limits start from just £50, but customers have the option to convert their credit to a, quote, pay now debit card. In future, Zilch also plans to launch credit coaching and credit score checking within the app. In testing, Zilch claims their product helped 25,000 people move into mainstream credit. So, Calypso, maybe I'll come to you first on this one. I mean, um, a product that, that sort of expands access to uh, those people who maybe previously couldn't get access to financial products, particularly credit um, products and doing that in a fair way, um, in principle sounds uh, positive, right? Yeah, um, hugely, and it's and it's great to see the way that um, you know that open banking is really facilitating you know the sharing of of more consumer data to be able to kind of inform that. So we're we're developing tailored products for different types of audience groups, and um, uh, we've never really had that before. Um, you know, everything's kind of been generated by by you know consumer credit reports. So how do we bring in other bits of disparate data, which actually helps you know prove credit worthiness, but in other ways that haven't perhaps been measured. So um, really great to see the work that that CFID is doing behind the scenes to try and um, encourage that and um, and promote more innovation in this space. So we start to see more products like Zilch up, you know, kind of 
entering into the market because you know there's a there's a, a huge exclusion here and um and you know access to you know capital however small should be something that's available to everybody yeah no i completely agree and actually i think you're right to call out the the credit decisioning piece and and how do you um pull in all of those disparate different parts of people's lives. Um, I mean, I remember when um, a firm, Jason, who you'll know, of course, being in the US, one of their big differentiators when they launched was um, their credit decisioning model. And I believe they were even pulling in little things around like, what type of device were people using to apply and what time of the day or night were they putting the application in? And they had all of these different models that sort of um, could give you a credit worthiness score, for want of a better term, um, that went obviously way beyond the sort of traditional credit score model. So, um, Jason, I, I suppose sticking with you, Calypso's right. I mean, the 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 the, the decisioning piece is key here, right? Yeah, I, I the thing that stood out to me, and I'll admit I don't know what this means, is the the ad. What is the ad sub- subsidized Googleization <laughs> component here? This is I love. Can I just say I love that you uh, that you call this out, right? Because um, this is the bit that I also didn't get earlier, but. They're basically creating a closed loop network where they connect people who want to spend and they're connecting them through sort of like selling targeted ads. So at the point, at the time where they actually want to sell. And so that's driving up um, basket sizes. It's driving up um, frequency of sales. And so... um, I know the CEO talks about, you know, these sort of just sales from a simple Google search are massively on the decline and sales through this type of sort of closed loop marketplace are, are massively on the rise. And so they're trying to rethink the model, ultimately getting to a point where that sort of ad revenue, for want of a better term, is subsidizing uh, lower fees and interest and higher cash um, for users. Okay, that makes sense. In I mean, I have to say, this kind of targeted advertising doesn't bother me, but I also spent 10 years like being the guy who did that targeted advertising and made the banner ads like follow customers around the internet. So I don't know, it doesn't creep me out. Um, as far as the business model that you're explaining, I think it's quite interesting. I mean, Amazon, I forget what the number is, but you know, some like grew a very substantial ad business from merchants advertising on Amazon. So to your point, if you think of like the Klarna's, the Affirm's, the Zilch's as you know, increasingly becoming a first destination for when somebody is shopping. So instead of going into Google and typing in whatever Adidas shoes, they're opening up Zilch or opening up Klarna and being able to place an ad at the time that customer is looking completely makes sense. And then for Zilch, Affirm, Klarna, et cetera, being able to use that revenue to offset the fact that they're offering you know, a 0% APR on a four to six week payment plan is interesting, makes sense. Um, I mean, I think some of the positioning you see from companies in the BNPL space can occasionally be a bit disingenuous. I'm less familiar with the stats in the UK, but there's been quite robust research in the US that that would seem to indicate the people who are most likely to use BNPL are already heavily indebted. So it, it doesn't necessarily tend to be people who, you know, don't want a credit card or don't have a credit card, but rather people who've already racked up substantial debt in other places and are using BNPL as an additional borrowing mechanism. And then the conversation becomes, you know, are the companies that are facilitating that, you know, doing so in a responsible way to make sure that the customers are not becoming overly indebted. One piece of doing that is is having access to information of, hey, how many other BNPL plans does this user have? You know, if if they're using Zilch, are they also using Klarna and Affirm and you know Monzo Flex and a bunch of other services that maybe don't appear on the credit bureaus? You know, in, in the U.S., this has been a still unresolved point of how are these plans? You know, these four week, six week plans. You know, how should they be reported into the credit bureaus and actually building the mechanisms to do that? 
Um, you know, the conversation there has been quieter recently, but maybe a year or so ago, that was you know quite quite a top of mind topic for regulators, legislators. Um, so yeah, on the one hand, you know, Calypso completely agree with you that that access to safe and responsible credit is important, including for people who maybe don't have a record on the traditional credit bureaus or there's not enough data to score them. On the flip side, companies offering credit, you know, I think do have a responsibility to underwrite customers responsibly and make sure that they're not taking on more debt than they're able to pay back. Yeah, completely agree. And and I mean, on, on that point, I, I really think um, Zilch is, has, you know, taken a forward step in that department, and they're investing heavily in education. In fact, you know, you know, some would say they're actually doing more than the government, you know, to kind of lead on that. So, um, so hats off to them. I think they've really kind of um, embraced that and, and recognize the risk and, and kind of opening that up. So, um, you know, hope, you know, many more BNPL um, providers, you know, kind of take that lead too. Yeah, they they so they um they actually use Yappily. Um they use Yappily's platform um to sort of do that whole responsible lending thing, Jason, that you mentioned, that sort of enhanced um credit decisioning process. The other thing that um they've announced really quite recently is a partnership with um the debt management charity Step Change here in the UK. Um offering some of those debt management services from Step Change um in the Yappily environment. Um so they are definitely um they have an eye on that whole um, responsible lending piece, Jason, that you mentioned. Um, Rachel, does any of that do anything to quell your suspicions, your your negative feelings that you uh, shared in the previous story around BMPL? I'd like to start my response by saying <laughs> I do. I completely believe that everyone has the right to responsible credit. I think that it, there is such an equity in the availability of it. My next breath, though. I don't understand how you can say that you're partnering with Step Change and you're trying to improve the well-being of people and in the same breath have a ad-driven market, like a marketplace in your app. I just don't. You are pushing. Yeah, you're going to drive sales. You're going to increase basket size. You are, you know, helping people at the point that which they're purchasing. Should they be purchasing? Am I purchasing like my home insurance or my groceries or am I buying things that I don't need? And that's the, you know, I've seen a lot of banks playing this, oh, responsible credit space, but like responsible credit is savings. It's, hey, let me help you save. Let me teach you how to save and I will give you access to credit. But primarily, I'm going to help you build your assets up because you are low on assets and you therefore need to start building them. I just, I find it, I think that it's great that companies like Zilch are doing this and, you know, using open banking, Experian, use Boost. They've done great work in helping people, you know, not having to take out more loans to build their credit score. But essentially, Zilch is about spending in credit to build your credit score. And it's just this cycle that keeps happening. And, the, you know, I've, I've read a lot about, especially in the US, the the racial wealth gap that is just keeps growing because it's people in minority areas, low income, low income areas who tend to be from a minority background who don't pass these credit worthiness checks. They go onto platforms like this. They're, they're building credit while also spending credit. And I I, fo- I feel like there must be a better way. And I think, Calypso, you, you absolutely, like you had it right, like the government, government in the UK, US, across the globe isn't doing enough around this stuff. And I think if you enter the lending space, you do have a higher responsibility to your customers. It's just, it's a shame because the flip side is it's such a lucrative business model because, you know, the amount of people who are like, oh, I'm going to start up a fintech, I'm going to lend because that's how I'm going to make money. And Obviously, it's great because it means we have more innovative services, but at, at what cost? And especially in a cost of living crisis across the across the globe, and with this increase in digital scrolling and consumerism, like we're just driving this behavior. And I I feel like there must be a a better way. Uh, do I have the solution now? No. Um, do I have lots of personal feelings about it? Obviously, yes. So yeah, I think. Is doing partnerships with people like Step Chain is really important. Thinking about savings habits, more important. And I'd love to see something like that come with these credit building propositions. I think it's, look, I think that's an absolutely um, fair foil, right, to the, the the other side of the conversation that we were having. And actually, I think it is right to challenge um, our sort of relationship with credit 
and with debt and trying to sort of encourage how do you flip that on its head and how do you actually start to save? And of course, there are um, emerging sort of save now, pay later propositions like accrue savings and others that are starting to come through that I think are also quite exciting. Um, Our next story comes from Sifted with a headline, Payments Fintech Modular has been ordered to stop onboarding new customers due to regulatory concerns. Modular is regulated by the FCA as an e-money institution in the UK. Earlier this month, they were issued a restriction which prevents them from onboarding new partner clients. This includes anyone who may wish to use their payments infrastructure for cards and accounts. Modular issues an update to prospective clients that they may not be able to onboard until early 2024 as they review their systems and processes with the FCA. There are a number of new regulations coming into effect next year, including the new UK consumer duty, which will affect many fintechs and thousands of other institutions. So, Rachel, I'll uh, come to you first on this one. What was your uh, what was your take? What was your initial reaction when you read this one? I swear I read an article about Modular saying that companies aren't moving quick enough in response to consumer duty, but I can't find it and I can't quote it. So perhaps I was wrong. Um, I think it's such an interesting space for BAS providers because technically you're just, you are providing service behind the payments that then go on to consumers. Is it your responsibility always to, to, to for the buck to stop with you when it comes to the implementation of consumer duty and making sure like products are fair and so I um, think that it is consumer duty has hit a lot of companies particularly hard and I think particularly in the as a service space they may not have taken it seriously as some of the direct consumer businesses so I am interested to see specifically because they've mentioned it might be consumer duty. It might be to do with the fraud regulation that's coming through. Not sure on the specifics of what's led to them pausing on boarding at the moment. Yeah, I'm, I, I think we've got um, you know a, a great kind of you know regulator here in the UK, and and they don't just kind of walk in and shut business down for for no reason, right? Um, but um, you know. And I think you know regulators will clamp down more, but that that's what happens in a maturing market. You know, as you have players trying to disrupt it, um, it doesn't stop innovation and and disrupting the status quo, but it stops bad actors. And um, and likely, you know, modular are going to need to go through a section one six six before they can start onboarding kind of new customers again. Um, but they'll be back with lighter pockets. And, you know, if anything, it helps, you know, kind of other companies, you know, adopt more kind of robust compliance, you know, so I think it's, um, it's not that we need to kind of single companies out, but I think we need to make sure that we set the standards. And, um, and, and certainly that's what, you know, UK is, you know, is known for is, is having really good standards, you know, for, for the fintechs. Um, you know, kind of in this space. So no, I totally agree, Jason. How how important is that regulatory scrutiny for BAS providers like Modular when they are providing the the plumbing, like the payments, the current accounts, the cards? No, I mean it. it, it it's huge, and it's not just Modular, and it's not just the UK, right? I mean, you've seen. Uh, other actions in Europe, so Railsers entity, uh, EMI entity, it, it operated in the EU. Uh, I think it was called PayRnet. Functionally, got shut down. Uh, another company with a similar model, uh, with a Lithuanian EMI license, uh, Transactive Transactive Systems, had a similar issue. And in the U.S., there's really a very broad reckoning in this banking as a service space right now over similar kinds of issues. I mean, publicly, you've had the Blue Ridge Order a while back. More recently, Cross River, slightly different issue that was related to fair lending. But but the fundamental question is when you have these, you know, as a service relationships or disaggregated relationships where you have a license holder, whether that's an EMI or a licensed bank, and then you have other entities building stuff on top of that, you know, at the end of the day, the responsibility lies with the regulated entity, right? And so we've seen a lot of issues, uh, particularly around in the US would be BSA, Bank Secrecy Act, but basically KYC, KYB, and AML compliance. Um, I think for a number of reasons. One, it's just more complicated the more entities that you have, right? So if you have 
uh, a company that holds an EMI license like Modular. You have a fintech that's building on top of that. And then you have the fintech's clients uh, actually making sure that you're fulfilling your KYC, KYB obligations, transaction monitoring. It's just inherently going to be more complicated as you introduce more actors and more systems. Um, I think another problem is just the incentive structure. A lot of the companies, both you know, the um, in the U.S., you're sort of middleware providers, so platforms that sit in between license holders and fintechs, uh, and particularly the fintechs that are building on top of these, tend to be venture backed, and thus they want to grow really aggressively in a short period of time. Often they have to, given that. They're typically not profitable and dependent on external VC funding to continue to exist. But that may lead them to take more risk than is necessarily appropriate or to focus more on growth and not invest enough in the appropriate controls to keep up with that rapid pace of growth. And that's you know really explicitly what you've seen in a number of the cases that I've cited. So I, I won't say that I'm extremely familiar with modular specifically, but the the headline and, and I did catch um, catch the story you know last week. It, it doesn't surprise me because you've seen a lot of these kind of issues with companies operating this model. I find it super interesting as well because like modular, they have Sage, I think they had Wagestream and Revolut. And so they're working with some really big players and they've been working with those big players for a really long time and your point around like the fintech's responsibility versus the the bass provider when i when i think about how i build products i do the vendor assessment i look at who i'm working with and yes they they might have some benefits from having a license but i'm still like i'm i have customers and i need to make sure that i am compliant and i think that 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 being missed and that level of due diligence at the top level you kind of expect that to be done by some of these fintechs. And it's surprising that it, while Modular has the license, it's still surprising that it falls to them and not perhaps some of these like these providers who are higher up the chain. But then I think it's interesting if I go back, uh, Jason, to your point about these guys at the bottom and then you've just got this sort of all of these providers that are building on top and there. Does it feel like they're just hitting a tipping point now in terms of scale and so the regulator is suddenly very interested where maybe that wasn't necessarily the case before yeah i think that's right i mean in in jurisdictions that i'm more familiar with which would include the uk and the us you know it, it seems like the approach tends to be that regulators are generally fairly i'll either say permissive or are maybe less worried when things are small and then when they get big or hit a certain critical scale, you know, then all of a sudden, like, okay, ooh, there are problems here. And, you know, they start paying attention and, and cracking down, um, which I think is what you've seen in the US. I think it's what you're seeing in the EU and the UK. Um, it, it operates differently in other places. I mean, I, I have a client in the Middle East where it took them two years to get an EMI license, their own EMI license. And they basically need to convince the regulators that the model that we're discussing, basically letting third parties be agents or distributors on top of their license, there it's ask for permission, not ask for forgiveness, which tends to be what we see in, in some Western, um, you know, Western developed economies where it's like the companies are off to the races and it might take regulators years to catch up and really start poking around and asking questions and then seeing some of these orders that we're now seeing. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. It does appear to be a trend at the minute, right? There does appear to be BAS providers that just are attracting regulatory scrutiny at the minute. I mean, um, Jason, I know you mentioned a couple, but then there was also um, Solaris Bank in Germany and you know, there's a handful of others and it feels like a trend that um, we're going to see increasingly. I don't think, Calypso, back to your earlier point, that that type of regulatory scrutiny is a bad thing, um, especially at that sort of like um, plumbing or, or rails level. Um, and I think you said it right. This doesn't feel like a railser where they found, you know, all of this misconduct um, and sort of compliance violations. This feels like, you know, a check, a due diligence piece in Calypso. I think you said it at the top that uh, they'll be back. And that's certainly what this feels like. 
Well, I think um, you know, um, you know, the market certainly feels saturated at the moment. You know, many many just don't have the runway that they need. So, um, you know, I think that's something to to be mindful of, and um, and and regulators are responding to that. And we're absolutely we're seeing and we'll continue to see consolidation as well. I completely agree. Um, all right, so now for our big click energy, a quick fire roundup of some more click worthy news this week. Um, so this story comes from FinTech Global um, and the headline is Una Financial and Valexa join forces in the UAE. So wealth tech disruptor Alexa hopes to shake up the digital investing sector in the UAE after announcing a strategic alliance with Una Financial. Using Valexa's investment tech, Una Financial want to build an innovative new platform connecting customers to investment opportunities at the click of a button. Valexa's CEO said, together we will reshape the future of the financial services industry in the UAE, making it more accessible and user-friendly for people from all walks of life. Una Financial's clients will be able to seamlessly join the world of investing across different financial assets around the globe. Now, for me, I think, as with any financial product, increasing access and that sort of usability piece is only ever one side of the equation, right? I think educating people around investing safely, investing sustainably, I think that's the critical piece here if this is going to be a success. And I think especially as they're talking about attracting folks into investing who aren't experienced investors. So, you know, I think for the region, this is um, this is really interesting. I think it's one to watch for sure. Um, but I'll be interested to see around that sort of like education piece, um, uh, whether that sort of forms a, 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 a key part of the proposition, um, but one that we'll definitely continue to keep our eye on. And now it's time for our and finally section of the show, which um, regular listeners will know is a look at something more offbeat from the news this week. So this one comes from BBC News um, with a headline, Citibank win an employment tribunal after sacking an employee for expensing a lunch date with his partner. So the hungry employee was dismissed last year for gross misconduct and subsequently sued for unfair dismissal. He was accused of expensing two sandwiches, two coffees and two pasta dishes during a business trip to Amsterdam, but claimed they were all for himself. He argues the claim, which came to just under £90, was within his daily allowance, but Citibank requires all expense items to be consumed by the employer. The courts agreed with Citibank, with the judge declaring, quote, I have found that this case is not about the sums of money involved. The case is about the filing of the expense claim and the conduct of the claimant thereafter. So, um, Rachel, we'll come to, come to you first on this one. Um, Ninety pounds seems like not very much uh, to lose your job over. I I am perplexed that this has made it into the the news in general. Um, I think, and also, it's an interesting one for Citibank to put in the news. Um, I don't know if they're trying to make a point about like professional standards. Um, I think in general, like, you know, expenses, it's a, it's a luxury. It's a privilege for us to have in certain industries. And if you are using them, like you should be very sparing and like respect policy. I, I totally buy that. On the other hand, when you're working really hard and you have the opportunity to go out and like, if it was like, you're going for a big, you know, you've got Michelin star, I'd understand, but if it's if it's a smaller expense, I I'm kind of you know. Do you need to come down with the full force of the law? But also, someone took it to tribunal, so I suppose you have to respond. Um, yeah, I, I don't. Weird what comes into fintech news these days. <laughs> Like I said, I mean, it's supposed to be a little bit more offbeat. Jason, you'll know they're <laughs> supposed to be a little bit lighthearted. I'm going to say it's a sign of the times and where we're at right now that the most lighthearted story we could find was one around someone getting fired for gross misconduct. Yeah, you're you're making me think of everything I expensed <laughs> in my in my previous lives. I, I do remember getting yelled at once for for a very expensive Uber when I was on a business trip. And my reaction was like, "What was I supposed to do? Like rent a car and pay for part? Like it would it would have been a wash." But I definitely remember uh, getting getting chastised for an expense report in my time or two. I did not get fired though, so 
<laughs> Congratulations. I mean, look, Calypso, I, I'm the same as Jason. I wouldn't necessarily want anybody raking over my historical expense claims. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'll second that. But this fit really feels like a slap on the wrist kind of situation, right? I mean, do you not have a, an adult enough kind of, you know, working environment where you can kind of manage that in a in a sensible way? It just, um, it doesn't actually promote, um, you know, the, the culture they're very in a very positive light, I think. But um, but you never know who the perpetrator was. So you know, maybe it was just an excuse. <laughs> so um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. But um, but in today's times where it's very hard, you know, to, to get a job um, you know, for most people, um, I'm sure that um, that's probably why he jumped on the bandwagon of, of um, taking it to court because uh, I don't know. Slim pickings out there, right? Yeah, I think so. It feels. Oh, sorry, Rachel, do you want to jump back in? No, I was going to say, I'm actually the opposite with expenses. I'm too scared <laughs> to like ever expense. So sometimes when I'm on trips, I'm like, oh, I'll just pay for this because, you know, I don't want to like push the limit. So actually 11FS finance team, you're welcome. <laughs> you, you know you know who you need to go on trips with? This I, guy, because he'll pay I don't for think it. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe not. Maybe not. All right, Rach, stay out of trouble. Um, That feels like a good note on which to end. So that wraps up this week's FinTech Insider. Um, Guys, thank you all so much for jumping on. It's been a really fun show. Let's go around, do a quick um, round the room. Where can people find out a a little bit more about you, a little bit more about your companies? Calypso, why don't we we start with you? Cool. Um, Yeah, well, uh, I guess biggest news for us um, this week is is launching um, FinTech Fringe Forum a place for experts and fintechs to connect and get access to support. So um, we have a waitlist, an operation, and we go live November 1st. So um, so go to fintechfringe.co and sign up, and um, and we look forward to, you know, providing that essential support the ecosystem needs. Thank you. And look me up on LinkedIn. There's not many Calypso Harlands out there. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, Calypso, look, thank you so much. Um, Jason, how about you? Yeah, I'm embarrassingly still on Twitter, so folks can find me there, uh, at MakulaJA. Uh, newsletter, they can subscribe at fintechbusinessweekly.com. And yes, LinkedIn also. It's, it's like the grown-up version of Twitter. I don't even know what Twitter yeah, X. is. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Formerly Twitter. Um, I don't know when they're going to move past that. I feel like I, I'm still reading. I'm still reading articles where it says X, formerly Twitter. So we know yeah, uh, every editor's nightmare. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> um, and Rach, how about you? Um, obviously, here at Eleven FS, so um, occasionally in a few content pieces. But other than that, I'm on LinkedIn because when Twitter moved to X, it was just too intense for me. So I'm Rita Richard Pandit on LinkedIn. Too confusing. Um, and as for me, you can find me at Ross Gallagher 7 on X, formerly Twitter. Um, and thank you for listening. Uh, please do join the conversation on social media or email podcast at 11fs.com. Thank you very much and goodbye. <laughs>